I'm glad you're here this morning. There are people who are at the fair today. Did you know that? It's the last day of the fair, 2018, and school starts this week. I don't know. It's parents, applause from the parents. Yes. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. I want to just ask if you would join me. I know we've had a time of worship, but uh, this song kind of came to me yesterday. And with the songs that we sang in worship, just kind of kind of talk about us offering our lives and giving our lives to the Lord and just asking and volunteering, you know, our life to him as he gave his life to us and just saying, God, have your way in me. So this song, it's a kind of an older song, but uh, it just says, I give you my heart. Would you sing this with me? If you know it, just make this a prayer this morning before we get into the word. This, this is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all. So this morning, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just be very near to each and every one of us this morning. God, you would speak into our hearts, that you would speak through me, that you would give me the right words in the right direction, and that our hearts would be receptive to what you want to speak into each and every one of us this morning. As we offer ourselves to you, we're so thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love that song. You know, some key lyrics like, it's my desire to honor God. I give you my heart. Lord, have your way in me. I want to start this morning with a passage of Scripture in Psalm 25. Psalm 25, the first five verses say this, very similar to the song that we just sang. Oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced but disgrace comes to those who deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. David's expressing his desire that God would guide him. God, I give you my life. I trust in you. Show me the path, show me the road. I put my hope in you. We're in a series we started last week called Life is a Highway. Rascal Flatts, the opening song of that, the opening line of that song says, life is like a road that you travel on, and that's very, very true. And as this, this psalm that we just read, there's a lot of analogies in the Bible that speak to and compare our life to a journey. Last week, we talked about this idea of destination. And in order to know the right direction to go, you've got to have somewhere that you're going. You've got to first know where you're going. And we ask this question, uh, where, where, where is your life taking you? You're on a path to somewhere. We're all on a path to somewhere, but where is life taking you? It, it's a very simple thought, but the thought that we talked about last week is this, that your direction is what determines your destination. You might have intentions that you want to go to a certain place, but it, really the destination is going to be determined by what direction 
you are going. So it's your direction, not your intentions, that determine your destination. Where is your life taking you? We have all kinds of good intentions. We have intentions to read our Bible more, to spend more time with God, to, to get in a habit of, of regularly attending church, of, of eating better, of, of exercising more, spending more time with family, saving more money, giving more money. But here's the deal. Intentions might be good, but they have to be acted on or else we're never gonna get where we want to go. It's our direction, not our intention that gets us where we wanna go, our destination. This passage of scripture, Ephesians chapter five that we read last week that we're gonna be in for a couple more weeks here. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 says, be careful how you live. Don't act like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. We are to live wisely. We're to walk circumspectly with caution, with care, watching, aware, alert. Be very careful how you walk, where you walk, where you step. If you have dogs or have a dog, okay? This would be a good analogy, a good application for your yard because that's where your doggies go and do their stuff. So if you are walking through someone's yard that has a dog in their home, you need to be careful where you walk, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Be careful. Watch out. Look around. Look ahead. Look back. If you're driving a car, you've got to be aware of everything that's going on around you. This morning, I want to talk about a significant part of the highway, and that is the guardrail. If, if, if you're a driver here, and I'm guessing that the ma- majority of people in this room today uh, are drivers or have driven, guardrails are, are something that you, you know that they're there, but most of us don't even notice them or take time to think that they're there, okay? A guardrail is a, it's a system of barriers, a, a roadside barriers that uh, keep your vehicle from straying into some dangerous or off-limit areas, where, where would you see a guardrail? You might see a guardrail on a bridge, okay? A median dividing two different lanes of traffic to keep traffic from crossing over. On a curve in the road, on a hillside that may have a sheer drop off. Guardrails are important and necessary. Can you imagine if you were driving across a bridge that had no guardrails? Like say for instance, the mile long bridge that goes to Polk City. How many of you be willing to drive across that mile-long bridge if the guardrails were just gone? Okay, some of you, you're in for danger. Some of you don't even like driving across that bridge anyway. Well, here's what happens when you you drive on a bridge that doesn't have uh, guardrails. You can get as close to the edge as you possibly can and still be okay. Think about this. You can drive right, right, just so long as your tire's just right on the edge. It's kind of... It's kind of how we do life sometimes. How close can I get to the line without, without going over? You know, and we kind of live that way. Nobody in their right mind is going to drive on the mile-long bridge without a railing and get as close to the edge as they can. Most people would stay far away from it. Why don't we do that with our lives? So there's guardrails on the, on the highway, on the roadways, and we need guardrails in, in our lives. A guardrail is, is a standard of behavior. It's a, it's a boundary. It's parameters that we put on our life to keep us from getting into areas that could be dangerous or off limits. So it'd be like us saying, in this area of my life, this particular thing in my life, this is as far as I'm going and I'm not going any further. Does that make sense? So there's certain things, certain guardrails that you might say, in this area, I I struggle a little bit, I have a problem, and so I know where the area of danger is, so I'm going to erect a guardrail that keeps me from getting into that area of danger. So a guardrail isn't something that you, like, drive up and hit against. You would never do that on purpose, but it's there in case you do. So 10 years ago this summer, my in-laws who live in Montana, who have a big motorhome coach, uh, set out on a, on a journey, on a trip, they, to come to Iowa to pick up some grandkids, a few of my children and a couple other grandkids, and they were going to go on a two-week trip to Texas. About an hour and a half or two hours into their trip from where they live in Montana on I-90, heading east, my mother-in-law, who was driving the motorhome, fell asleep. 
Thankfully, there was a guardrail. It did some serious, serious damage to their motorhome. It, their car that they were pulling, their Cadillac that they were pulling on a trailer behind, uh, caught that, that guardrail through the engine compartment of their, of, their, of their Cadillac, went right through the driver's seat and out the back window. It impaled their Cadillac. Ripped up the bottom side of their motorhome. Well, here's the deal. You know what? So thankful, even though that did a ton of damage to their vehicle, if that guardrail hadn't been there, they probably wouldn't be here today. So while guardrails is, are not something that we want to hit, it's there in the time of need when we might stray to say, hey, you're getting off the path, and this is here for your protection to keep you from being in more serious trouble or losing your life, okay? So we, we, we erect these guardrails in our lives because there are always distractions. There are always going to be temptation. There is never a time in our life, no matter how old you are, no matter what you do in your life, where you're ever going to get away from temptation of the enemy to wander into these areas. I don't know, I don't know, I don't care how long you've been in church, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, how old you are, it doesn't matter. We all are going to face this, and so we need to know what do we do to prepare for that. So to have no boundaries, no standards, no limits, no convictions in our lives is, not, is gonna lead to us living in an out of control life. It's honestly gonna put us on a highway to hell. So we need, those, we need those boundaries in our life. And so I wanna talk to you this morning about a few guardrails, okay? Just for instance, things that we can erect in our lives, in important areas of our lives. First one that I wanna look at is this area of friendships, okay? Friendships greatly influence the direction and quality of your life. We all have friends. You know this, the saying is, show me your friends and I will show you your future, right? How many of you heard your parents say something like that? Okay, you may have said that as a parent, but it's so true. Another one is that you're only as good as the company that you keep. So I want for you to think with me this morning uh, about your core group of friends. And again, I don't, it doesn't matter how old you are. I'm not just talking to teenagers. This, this message is appropriate because school's starting this week, and these are some good things for us to think about. But life is happening every day, and no matter if you're, you're out of school and you're not going back to school, you still have friends. So think for a minute about the core group of people that you hang out, the people that you spend the most time with, the people that are the most significant in your life that you let into that sphere of influence. Are those people going in the direction that you want your life to go. Do you have to pretend to be somebody when you're with those people? Do you feel pressure to compromise when you're with them? Friends is an area where we need to erect some serious guardrails. Proverbs say, Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and you will become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Another area that I want to talk about this morning is the area of purity. And this isn't just for teens or single people, it's for all of us. We need some guardrails in our life in some very key areas. Like the kind of TV shows we watch the movies that we go to, the music that we listen to, the kind of websites that we visit. Here's, here's what I want to say about this. Our lives, we, we, we sung it in the song that we sang, I want to honor you, God. First and foremost, our lives ought to honor God. But we need to honor ourselves as well because we are made by God, created in his image. He paid the greatest sacrifice for us. We ought to be honoring our own lives in the choices and decisions, the things that we do. Not only do we honor God, honor ourselves, we need to honor our spouses. We need to honor our children. If you're not married, your future spouse and your future children, the decisions that you make affect the people around us. The Bible tells us flee sexual immorality. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, run from sexual sin. That's a big, broad category there. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. 
Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. And I mentioned last week in my message on direction that there may be some people in this area uh, tend to stumble or swerve off the path, uh, maybe as it relates to your activity on the internet. Here's, here's what I want to say. All of us need some kind of accountability in life. The internet is one of those places where we have a pretty private life, it's just us and a computer. So internet accountability, I think, is a key. There are services out there, such as Covenant Eyes or Triple X Church. I subscribe to Covenant Eyes for my family. And and here's the deal, it's, it's something that you subscribe to. It's not a software that you put on your computer, so it's out there somewhere. I subscribe to that, and and it's not saying you can't go to places, what happens is, my internet activity can be given to anybody that I choose for it to go to. It could go to my wife, it could go to a good friend, an accountability partner, whoever. But wouldn't that do something for us if we have this uh, struggle of swerving off the road, of veering off in this area, just to say, hey, find a key person in my life that I know I can trust, who will be honest, who will be truthful, who will look me in the eye and say, how are you doing? And I offer, I offer all of my traffic, my internet activity, it gets emailed to them every month. If that's going to your spouse, it might make you uh, think twice about going to that site. Because guess what? He or she is going to see wherever you've been. These are just guardrails that we can set up in our life to say it protects us. Guardrails are to protect us and to direct us. So if that temptation of the internet is still too much, then just put a filter on it. There's a service with that that you can just say, you know what, I don't want any pornography sites to even be available to me. I don't want any gambling sites to even be available to me. So you can set it to do that, and it just does it. Why not? If that's a problem, the whole accountability thing doesn't seem to work, why not do that? So if that's a problem, you say, well, I don't want want somebody limited where I can go. Just get rid of the internet. Who, Who has to have the internet? Is that a law that we have to be on the internet? You're saying, this is like drastic, Pastor Jeff. You're getting like really like deep in this thing. And I'm going, okay, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, if your right eye offends you, get a spoon and dig it out. That sounds a whole lot more drastic than just turning off the internet. If your right hand offends you, what are you supposed to do? Cut it off. Is that really what Jesus meant? What he's saying is, look, if you've got a problem, get serious about it. I don't think he was saying that we ought to just all, because all of us, who, who of us shouldn't be plucking our eye out or shouldn't be cutting off our hand? You know what I'm saying? If, if this is the clicker that operates the mouse that goes, just cut it off. But then you've got this hand. You know what I'm saying? We have to learn to be a left-hand mouse operator. There's ways around it. This, Jesus, what he's saying is, let's get serious about the things in life that, that we're dealing with, that we're struggling with, and go to some extreme. Guess what? Turning off the internet isn't going to hurt anybody, especially if that's an area where you, where you really, really struggle. Give access to your devices, your cell phone, your tablet, your computer. Somebody should know your passwords, preferably your spouse. I know I'm getting like pretty, pretty deep into this thing. And I'm not not trying to stir up any problems or issues or make you doubt or or wonder, you know, who's doing what. The thing is, is we just need accountability. Accountability doesn't hurt anybody. It helps all of us. It's there to protect us. So Jeannie knows how to get into my cell phone. She knows my password. So anytime she wants to get on my cell phone, she has access to that. She can get into my email, into my text messages. She can get into all that. Guess, guess what that does to me when I'm, when I'm doing stuff on my phone? You know, if my wife can see this, I better be careful what I'm doing. Simple as that. It makes me accountable so that I stay on the path. So I've got a guardrail that says my wife can look at my phone anytime she wants to. I'm not, I'm not like saying, taking it to her saying, look at my phone, 
you can trust me, you can trust me, but anytime she wants to, she can have access to that. And so it makes me be very careful what I do so that she can see what I do. I would recommend that to all of us because I think accountability is just a good thing. Don't have personal meetings with the opposite sex without your spouse knowing. Guess what, I don't, I don't have lunches with just one other female person. Just don't do that. There has been times where I've had a situation where I was meeting somebody and uh, it was in a public place and I called Jeannie and I said, here's what's going on. I'm meeting at this place for this person. They need to do this. And I just let her know all the details. She can track me. She can come by there if she wants to. I, I, I counsel with uh, females in, my op- in the office during office hours. Outside of office hours, I don't do that. I've had occasion where I've had to do something like that and Jeannie comes along with me. It's just, that's just the accountability of I want things to look right so that if anybody ever saw that, they would know what's going on. So that I'm all out there so everybody sees it. I'm not doing anything secret. I'm putting guardrails. When I was a youth pastor, I would never, well, when I was a youth pastor in, in Montana, I gave rides to kids. I would go pick them up in the van and take, I would never be alone in a van with a female, ever. I would go so far out of my way to take a, a girl home and keep a guy in the, in the van with me just for my protection, their protection, and uh, I, I would work that out, and I'd let everybody know that ahead of time. So here's my, here's my rule. I, I don't, I'm not in the van with, with girls, just me and girls, okay? Not because I don't trust myself, not because I don't trust them. I just want it all to look right, and I don't want to put myself in a compromising place. It's a guardrail, and that's how I operated. Guess what? I didn't have any issues or any problems because that's the way I operated. We ought to, we ought to have that accountability. So there's purity. There's a lot of uh, opportunities for us to set guardrails. That's a boundary that says, this is as far as I'm going, and I'm not going any further. And that, it's not just arbitrary me deciding that. That comes out of who, who I know that God wants me to be. What does God's word say to me about who I should be, right? I know who I am. I know where I've struggled. That's where my guardrail goes. You might, you might, in that area, your guardrail might be somewhere else, but I know where my guardrail is, and if I need to turn off the internet, that's where it goes because I want a right relationship with God and I want right relationship with people. Guardrails in your finances. We live in America, probably the, one of the most greedy nations on the face of the earth. If you haven't been to a third world country, go there sometime and you come home and see how we live. We, we're blessed. I'm not, gonna, I'm not knocking this. We're, you know, I'm not saying we're bad, bad Americans. We just have availability of stuff. It's so easy for us to live greedy lives, to think I deserve this, I deserve that. And most Americans live upside down. They're deep in a hole of debt. The majority of Americans don't live within their means. They live way overextended. We're, we have this, uh, an issue of greed. We need guardrails in our finances. We need to be responsible with our money. A way to do that is to put these things in order. Give, save, live. You got that? Give, save, live. Most people have the opposite. It's live, and if I got enough left over, I'll, I'll try to save some, but usually I don't have anything to give after that. But the, God's principles in his word tell us that we ought to, we ought to give first to God. Bring the tithe, the first 10% into the storehouse. Not because God needs the money. It's because we need to let go of our money. We need God to be in control of our money. So we say 10%. And here's the deal. No matter if you've been doing this or not, I would just challenge you. If you need a guardrail in this area, you say my finances are upside down. Even if you feel like you can't do this, here's what you do. Start over, scratch. And you've got some debt that you've got to pay. Start over and just say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give, save, live. 10% off the top. That's God's. How much am I going to save? 10%, 20%, 5%, and then I'm going to live on the rest. And then whatever that amount is, live within that. Just say, this is, this is all I have to work with. You don't need satellite TV. You don't need the Hallmark Channel. You really don't need ESPN. Okay? What's everybody grumbling about? <laughs> Do we need that stuff? <laughs> There's ways to live within our budget. Ways, and here's what you're going to find out. You, you're going to have way more than you ever thought you did. We waste a lot of money because we live 
very, very greedy. Jesus said these words, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. So as we consider various guardrails that we need to place in our lives, what we're doing is we're stepping away from potential harm to us, and what we're really doing is stepping toward a God who loves us very much. He's not trying to keep you from something. He's trying to draw you toward someone, and that someone is himself. He's saying, come closer to me. So I want you to ask this question. What would happen in your life if you had adequate guardrails in place in significant areas of your life? How would it be different? I want to challenge you today to stop flirting with disaster. Start establishing some boundaries, some guidelines, some guardrails. I don't, I don't believe that anyone has ever regretted establishing a guardrail. But I can tell you for sure there are plenty of people who have huge regrets for not having them. Daniel chapter 1. You know the story of Daniel. 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched into Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple and he took the best of everything that he could find and took it back to Babylon. He took the most talented, useful, beautiful people, and he took things of value out of the temple, all the gold, the silver, the bronze, he he took all that and took it back to Babylon. Daniel was among those who were taken back to Babylon along, it mentions three of his friends, we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were taught language and literature of Babylon, and they they were there to serve the king. Daniel chapter one, verse eight says, Daniel was determined that, 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 that's almost enough. Daniel was determined. Daniel had his mind set. He, he had focus. He had vision. He had direction. He had boundaries. He had guardrails. Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to him. So the king was offering all these special people all the special food that came from the king's table. And Daniel said, look, this is breaking some of the laws that we're used to back in our, our home country. These are, these are religious things. And he determined that he wasn't going to compromise. And so he talked to the, 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 the guy that was, that was over them, the, um, the, the, whatever his name is. He's got a name, Ashpenaz. He was the chief official. So he, he talked to him and decided, I'm going to offer this deal. And he off, what he said is, can we... Can, we, can you just feed us water and vegetables? We don't want the meat. We don't want the, we don't want the wine from the table. We just want vegetables and water. He resolved not to defile himself. He made up his mind. He devoted himself to godly principles. He committed himself to a course of action. Daniel was drawing a line, and he was determined that he wasn't going to compromise. So here's... Here's how the the story goes, reading on in verse 9. Now God is how it starts. I think that's something that a lot of us don't take time to consider. Something we often forget about. See, God had a plan for Daniel. And God has a plan for your life and my life. Not only do guardrails protect, but they direct. It says, now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. So they asked him about serving the vegetables and the water diet instead of eating all this, uh, the royal food and the wine. And this guy was afraid of what would happen to him because if they found out that he was feeding them something different because they looked weaker than everybody else, then he would be in trouble, possibly losing his own, not, not only his job, but possibly his life. But they worked out an agreement where they were going to do a 10-day experiment and then compare themselves to the rest. And at the end of that 10 days, Daniel and his friends looked healthier and better nourished than all the rest. Verse 17 of Daniel chapter 1. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with him, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Rakshak, and Benny, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they entered the king's service. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So what do we take away from all this? Like Daniel, we need to make up our mind. We need to make up our mind before our story our stories end because we know how the stories end if we don't. You have absolutely no idea what God wants to do in and through your life. And as I look across the room, I see so much potential in all of our lives. We have no idea what God wants to do, what he could do if we would set a different, if we'd live by a different set of standards. And I'm talking about just drawing some lines and living the way God would have us to live. And we'll never know that until we do what Daniel did. And Daniel made up his mind. In this area, this is as far as I'm going to go. And what I'm telling you is that God can take a decision like that and direct your entire life from this point on if you'll make up your mind ahead of time. You see, you gotta determine before you're in the situation. Last week I told you a story about when I was selling books door to door and I walked to this house on, on a Saturday morning and there was a, a married woman who was there. She let me know that her husband and her kids were gone and she invited me in the house. If you weren't here, you have to go back and listen to that message. But this older married woman, very beautiful lady, basically propositioned me. And I told you how my first instinct was to run to flee, to get out of that place. And all week long I thought about this because I, I, I hadn't really thought through this whole story, but I'm thinking, what, what is it about me that made me run at that point? Was it because I'm, I'm just that strong? No. We're all humans. But I go back to a time about four or five years earlier when I was a, a high school student, a junior in high school, it was a Sunday afternoon youth group meeting, just a handful of kids with our, with our pastor. And that day, he challenged us to make a, a, a purity statement, to, say, to challenge us to live life so that we would save ourselves sexually until we were married. And I, and I took the challenge. So as a 16-year-old young man, I, I, I mean, I didn't think down the road, like, this is what's going to happen to me if I make this decision. At that point, I just decided, you know what? That sounds right to me. God has someone out there for me, and I'm going to save myself for that time. Because I made that decision four or five years earlier, when I found myself in this situation, because of the decision that I made there, my boundaries were set, my guardrails were in place, so that when I got into a situation where now I could compromise, I, f I ran. And I think how my life could be so much different if I didn't have those guardrails in place. I will guarantee you that my wife and my children, I, we probably wouldn't be together. My life would have taken a completely different turn. It very well could have, which means that I wouldn't be here, wouldn't have been here, I wouldn't be your pastor today. Because the choices that we make aren't just events. They're, they're setting the course or the direction for our lives. And so determining like Daniel, to make up your mind, resolve in your heart that, that for me, this, it doesn't matter what anybody else says or does, this is what I'm doing. And I truly believe with all my heart that God will honor those decisions. He's going to establish you and he's going to use you just like he did Daniel. So this morning, there's some people sitting here and you're, you, you, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you about setting some guardrails. There's some of you this morning that you know in your heart you're not right with God. And today, you need to make a decision to follow Jesus. With every head bowed and eye closed, I want to ask you this question. If that's you today, and you're saying, Pastor Jeff, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to honor God with my life. It's on a path that's going to nowhere. I want my life to have meaning and purpose. If today, you're giving your life to Jesus. I just want to invite you to raise your hand. Thank you. Come across the room. Would you stand with me this morning? There's people, many hands that were raised. There's many people here. You know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about 
one of the guardrails that I talked about, probably things that I didn't even talk about, but the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. As we sing this song this morning, what I wanna invite you to do, I want you to come to this place. We're gonna make this altar a place of prayer. And whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, whether you offer your life to Jesus or there's a guardrail that you need to establish in your life and today is the day that you're gonna do that. You come here, offer your life to Jesus, honor him first, set those boundaries, set those standards. Let God speak to you. Let him fill you with his Holy Spirit and with his power to be able to work it out. As we sing, would you just come?